What is up, freaks? Welcome back to Tales from the Crypt. It's your boy Marty Bent here on a beautiful, actually very ugly Thursday afternoon here in Brooklyn. It's raining. It's uh, it's a bit chilly out, but guess what? It's first day of the Marsh Madness tournament. I got Vermont versus Florida State on in the background. It's currently a tie game with two minutes left in the first. Uh, potential upset alert, 13 over 4. Vermont is winning right or excuse me, tied with Florida State right now. Um, before we hop into this week's topics, Matt is in the Dominican Republic. He joins me from a foreign land. How's the weather where you are, Matt? It's absolutely gorgeous. I'm just uh, sitting by the water. It's fantastic. Yeah, the freaks can't see you, but he looks like Archer after he was marooned on that island drinking <laughs> rum every day. He's got a he's got a short sleeve Hawaiian shirt unbuttoned. I've got a nice view of, uh, of Matt's chest pubes right now. And with that being said, this week's episode of Rabbit Hole Recap is brought to you by our friends at Unchained Capital. You freaks know all about them. They're down in Texas. They're providing you guys with multi-sig vault, with a multi-sig vault platform. It was just released last week, and it's there to help enhance your security while preserving your sovereignty. <clears throat> uh, so they have uh, basically a two or three multi-sig setup, which you can engage in. Uh, they're compatible with Trezor and Ledger. Again, that's two or three multi-sig. You hold two of the keys, so you always have control of your Bitcoin at any given point in time. It's 100% cold storage. Get off the exchanges. Uh, there are risk if you have uh, your stuff in a hardware wallet and you are the only signer. Multi-sig, as we've been saying for the last few weeks, few months actually, uh, is just a way to become more secure and have more certainty and, and decrease the risks, uh, more specifically the physical risk that exists. Um, on top of this, if you guys go check this out, unchained-capital.com slash vaults, and you guys sign up uh, this week or, or in the next couple months, you're going to get a free three-month subscription to the Bitcoin Standard Research Bulletin by the much vaunted uh, Safedina Moose. So the man who wrote the Bitcoin Standard, he's been putting out an incredible Bulletin letter once a month. You guys are going to get free. Uh, you're going to get that for free for three months. Um, so go check out unchained-capital.com today. Matt, it's been a whirlwind of the last uh, 16 hours. First topic of the day, SQ Crypto hit the scene with a bang last night. Uh, Jack Dorsey came out on Twitter and basically announced that they are uh, Square is opening an initiative to support uh, three to four open source d developers working on Bitcoin Core or other cryptocurrency, open source cryptocurrency projects, uh, came out of nowhere. Uh, I have a lot of thoughts on this, but first, my voice has been, or excuse me, I've been talking enough in the beginning of this episode. Let's hear what your thoughts first. What do you think of that? I mean, it's, it's absolutely great news. It's unequivocally great news. It's good to have, um, um, it'll help, it should help create a more resilient, more robust development ecosystem in Bitcoin. You know, we already have, um, a couple of other groups that are funding developers. We have Blockstream, we have Chain Code Labs. So this adds another um, avenue for developers to find funding, you know, so they're not doing it on necessarily a voluntarily volunteer basis. They don't have to worry about, you know, like day to day expenses, things like that. It gives them actual financial security so they can focus on what's important. Yeah, no, it's. Um and I wrote about this in the Ben today. It's been a topic of heavy contention within the quote unquote crypto space for a while is dev incentives. Do they need to be baked into a protocol? Why do uh, open source protocol developers work on the protocols they do? What drives them towards that? And how do you compensate them? Uh, a lot of people believe that uh, going forward, we may need to create protocols embedded with certain developer funds that uh, sort of entice developers to come work on those projects in particular. I'm not as much of a believer in that. I think what we're seeing uh, with Jack specifically jumping in last night is a product of Bitcoin's resiliency over the last decade in particular. So uh, I wrote about in the newsletter again this morning, block streams and the chain codes of the world. Uh, they had the prescience to see uh, the potential of Bitcoin early on and really put some skin in the game, sort of leading the way, helping some uh, very skilled developers focus on Bitcoin full time. And I think uh, Square entering the game now says a lot about Bitcoin's maturity after a decade. It has proven to be reliable. It produces blocks roughly every 10 minutes and has done what it's market it will do for 99.99% of the time that it's been running. So uh, a lot of people are like, well, what, what, 
how do you compensate devs? How do you compensate devs? I think what we're seeing is Bitcoin being so useful and providing utility for a company like Square right now as they're getting more into Bitcoin with Cash App and potentially their POS systems. They're saying, hey, this is going to this open source protocol is going to provide us a lot of value, it seems, going forward. So, hey, let's contribute. And I think that's what we're seeing is a validations of Bitcoin maturity. I don't know if you agree with that or not, but that's just the thoughts that I have. Yeah, well, very well put. You know, there's, it, there's a soft incentive here, right? It's that that Jack and Square benefit from Bitcoin succeeding and, and doing better, right? So, so all these stakeholders have this soft incentive to then help improve Bitcoin and help uh, foster its adoption because it then benefits them. I mean, it's part of the reason why we do this podcast in the first place, right? Um, because of that soft incentive. And then, you know, a lot of people brought up like, you know, the Segwit2x and the New York agreement and stuff like that. And absolutely, like everyone should still be vigilant, you know, don't treat Jack like a demigod necessarily, you know, unnecessarily, but you, you know, you stay critical of him and you, you stay critical of, of the work they, they do. Don't trust verify, but unequivocally yeah, well, it's, it's good news. It's just more developer funding. Yeah, we'll be able to know who Square's hiring. We'll be able to track their GitHub pull request and and maybe have their pull request uh, magnified and <laughs> and and reviewed more if you're if you're worried about a conspiratorial takeover by by the corporations Bilderberg. Well, that's like that's what's so nice about having even more having another. Now we have three main groups that are are funding Bitcoin development directly. So the more we have. Um, the more they check each other and stay critical of each other. And that's, that's really great to see. I think, I think we'll see a lot more of these style, uh, both from companies and also both from, you know, wealth, wealthy benefactors that, that want to see Bitcoin succeed, that hold a lot of Bitcoin. Yeah. And this, <clears throat> you haven't heard yet cause you haven't listened to the episode cause you're not as much of a fan, but Carl Dong and I spoke about this, uh, topic in particular. And he said in China, uh, there's a WeChat group, I think it was particularly their lightning WeChat. Actually, I'm not sure if it was their lightning group. It was a WeChat group in China that he's a part of, uh, but it's a bunch of Bitcoiners and they're actually crowdsourcing funds and they had raised up to 50 Bitcoin uh, and were picking a developer to sort of donate and sponsor. Um, so even crowdsource individual Bitcoiners <laughs> seem to be coming together and doing this as well. And again, I think it, it speaks, it's a testament to the maturity of the network at this point. Uh, obviously, in the early years when Blockstream and chain code were first arising, it was a little riskier to put some money and put some skin in this game in particular. Now, again, a decade in, uh, I think that decade mile marker was a huge mental hurdle for a lot of people. And we're seeing very quickly after the 10 year anniversary, uh, more legitimate incumbents sort of saying, all right, this looks like it'll be around here for a while. Let's start co contributing. Yeah, I mean, this is a multi-billion dollar company, public company uh, with a, a billionaire CEO, and they're throwing their weight behind this. It's, it's pretty fucking crazy to uh, see yeah. unfold. So should we, should we front run the uh, Bilderberg conspiracies about <laughs> Jack trying to take over Bitcoin and protocol development? Well, uh, has anyone checked to see how much uh, <laughs> Twitter and Square stock that Bilderberg owns? Do they own any? I don't know. We should. Freaks. Hopefully somebody, they don't. Somebody, <laughs> somebody stat checks that. We need to know. Um, and also, I don't, I don't appreciate the swipe on not listening to the, your two most recent pods yet. It's the far, farthest I've ever oh, fallen I'm behind. Kidding. And I, you know, I happen to be uh, a little off the grid at the moment, so I'm looking forward to listening jab. to them. Carl is awesome. I've, I've met him, and he's, he's fantastic. It was a light jab. I was kidding. Um. What else was I going to say? It's something to say. Oh, yeah. So a lot of people, some people came out and said, this isn't enough. How, how, is, <laughs> how is it that Square is only hiring three to four devs? Come on. Let, let, let's let this stuff develop. Start small and grow from there. Just the fact that they're putting some skin in the game and showing support should be enough to be like, okay, uh, this is like a legitimizing stamp of approval. And I think there's a lot of – like. Another th and I wrote about this in the Ben today. A lot of people working on certain protocols that have problems 
raising money and funds it may not be a dev incentives or fundraising problem it may be a product market fit problem and maybe think harder about that than than the money problem yeah yeah and this is very much a you know see how it goes get community engagement dip dip their foot in kind of exercise here and they you know and if it if it all goes to plan then the you know, who knows how many developers they'll end up hiring you know it's, it's got to start somewhere exactly also Start small growth from there also what's really interesting is uh we keep mentioning Blockstream uh and skin in the game they had a really cool approach i thought i don't know if they still do but they were definitely doing it in the beginning where they would time lock bitcoin, bitcoin for bonuses yeah it was only for the bonuses but it's like that's a pretty cool concept where you have bitcoin but you you don't get to access it's like stock options like delayed stock options you don't get to access it for a couple of years so you're incentivized to uh to help Bitcoin succeed. Yeah, no, that's a great, uh, that's a great point. Do you have the balls to time lock some of your Bitcoin? I mean, I, there's, why would I ever do that? Like I'd rather have access to it. It just seems counterintuitive for me, but I, I like it from a, a company's perspective to incentivize as bonuses. You know, you, you shouldn't time lock all your, you know, all their Bitcoin, their pay shouldn't be time locked, but. All right, let the record show Matt is not uh, willing to time lock his Bitcoin. <laughs> Fuck that. Why would I ever do that? <laughs> you know, you you can't sell your Bitcoin cash if it's if your Bitcoin's time locked. That's true. You can't participate in fork governance. It'll be uh, time locked on both forks. Or both chains, excuse me. Um, yeah, there, might, topic, there like, might there might be a right. bunch of Blockstream developers that hold a bunch of Bitcoin cash that they can't sell right now. That's a fun one. <laughs> it's hilarious. <laughs> Um, next topic, uh, lightning loop by lightning labs. This, uh, post dropped out of nowhere yesterday. Uh, lightning labs is announcing the lightning loop alpha, an easier way to receive on lightning. And it seems like they're utilizing atomic swaps to help people with congestion problems on certain sides of their lightning network channels. Is that a correct way of describing it? Would you say? Yes. Basically, you don't have to close your channel. You can you can send a lightning payment, an outbound lightning payment, and receive the equivalent amount as an on-chain transaction. So you're like leaving yes. lightning without closing the channel. Yes. And this is to help people, again, like businesses that receive a lot of lightning payments and may have a, an overbalanced channel in their direction. This helps them sort of even that out and are able to receive and send payments uh, at all times. Whereas the way Lightning's structured right now, it's a bit of a more manual process. Yeah, you would need like to use like a Thor type service or you would have to actually have someone open a channel in the opposite direction to you so you have inbound liquidity to receive. So the easiest way to mm -hmm. get inbound liquidity is to pay people things. So if you if you're buying things with Lightning, every time you do that, you're you're getting more inbound liquidity and you're losing outbound liquidity. But if you're like a shop or if you're just getting started and most of your things are receiving payments, then it's really hard to build that inbound liquidity and keep keep your balance. So by using something like Lightning Loop, you'd be able to basically make a payment, but you're not making a payment, right? Because you're getting paid back on chain. So it's not like you lose money doing it. Like if otherwise you'd have to spend a thousand dollars to have a thousand dollars liquidity back if someone doesn't open a channel with you. So it's a nice little solution to to that balancing issue. Yeah, it seems like a very creative solution. And atomic swaps fascinate me, man. They're, they're still something I can't fully. Uh, I mean, I can wrap my head around them. I cannot explain the technical details to to you uh, in very very good detail. But it's something that. This fascinates me, the, the concept of atomic swaps in general. Yeah, it should be really interesting to watch all this, to watch all this unfold. I, there's some promising things, particularly with like cross-chain atomic swaps. Um, but yes. there seems to be some issues there right now in terms of being able to game it. And if you can game it, then it's, it's a non-starter. Yes, that's true. But it seems like progress is being made I believe Alex Bosworth and Brian Vu, who uh, made this announcement, are going to have more information for you freaks uh, in the coming weeks. But uh, I believe there's an alpha uh, that has been released, an alpha version. If any of you developers that may be listening to this want to go test it out uh, and are interested in testing out Lightning, in particular Lightning Loop, 
Uh, we'll link to that blog post in the uh, comments, or excuse me, in the description, and you guys can check it out there. Next topic, Blockstream redesign. So this is actually pretty dope. I wrote about this in the event earlier this week too. Uh, the wallet formerly known as Green Address, which is a very popular and uh, reliable multi-sig uh, mobile app solution for Bitcoiners uh, for many years has rebranded as under the Blockstream umbrella now. It's now Blockstream Green, and it comes with a complete redesign and a couple of uh, enhanced functionalities, uh, a couple of those being uh, 2FA now. I believe there's a 2FA uh, sort of layer of security to it, and then you can... Uh, for Android users in particular, you can uh, connect your hardware wallet and only the Treasure One and the Ledger Nano S right now. But I think they're looking to roll out other versions of the hardware wallets and eventually get it on iOS as well. But it seems like a good start for the redesign and rebrand. Uh, yeah, so it, it is out on iOS, but not hardware wallet support because... Yes, not hardware wallet support. iPhones don't let you do it through connecting a USB, so... They're gonna they're gonna roll out hardware support with that new Ledger Nano, the X, I think it was, the one with Bluetooth. Yeah, the Bluetooth. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and um, and I yeah, there's, so the redesign's really clean. It's it's been for a while like one of the best wallets on iOS is probably undeniably the best wallet on iOS now. I don't have an iPhone, but I'm pretty sure. Um, I don't know what else could compete with it. Uh, it's worth noting their multi-sig solution. Um, it's two of two. Yeah, it's something they pioneered a while back. It's they hold one key, you hold the other, either on your device or on your hardware wallet. Um, so you need them. So you can't move the funds yourself, and they can't move their funds with themselves. But you need them to move the funds. That's where the two factor comes in, because they use a traditional two factor system, um, where then once you approve the two factor, then they sign with their key. Now, to get around the issue that maybe green address disappears on you or something and they don't sign your transaction, they have a like a time lock system where it'll automatically send the Bitcoin in the balance to one of your other addresses in case of them becoming unresponsive or no one signing the key. It just automatically times out. Is that an address you give them when you're onboarding? I'm pretty sure I haven't used green address in about three or four years, but uh, yeah, I haven't used it in a while either. I'm pretty sure it's an external address. I'm pretty sure you give them an external address, but maybe they have a built in system where it just shows up in the app for you. I'm not sure. Yeah. Um, yeah. So again, just a, another option on the market <laughs> for users, depending on uh, your, your your particular situation or your particular use case, this is uh, yet another, I mean, this is a multi-sig option that's been around for a while. Uh, it's been rebranded and been upgraded, but uh, the theme of multi-sig has been hot around this block for a while, uh, at least recently. Uh, and it, it's just adding, it feels like the options for this sector in particular are, are growing by the day and by the week, and that's just great to see. Another thing that I like about Green Address is that they... And they've had this feature forever, Block, and unfortunately, Blockstream Green now. Unfortunately, it never really caught on. Is uh, is Green address it, which is if a merchant is is if a merchant can join their program, or basically because it's two of two, uh, and they need to sign every transaction, they basically are promising the merchant that they're not going to double spend the transaction. So you can accept zero confirmation transactions like relatively safely because you're just trusting green address and and if they want to build relationships with merchants then they're not going to fuck you over which is a cool concept that seems pretty cool yeah they've had it yeah. forever no one ever it never really caught on i don't i don't know i thought it was a cool little little hack that's an interesting topic how how much stuff in bitcoin in particular and software and wallet wise do you think is just uh hit the market too early as opposed to like being on time and being so like proof of reserves is like an example that we've talked about before like Franken had proof of reserves we feel like it should be demanded but like nobody used it is this stuff too early like what do you think I mean I think uh, the, pretty much everything is too early but we're just we're early right now so uh, you need the users you need the actual demand for any of this stuff to 
And so, but this is the time where you flesh it out and you, you see what works and you see what doesn't. Yeah, that's true. Um, so check out uh, Blockstream Green now if you are an Android or iOS user. Check it out. Let us know what you think. And it's also, uh, it's worthy of a shout out that they also redesigned their Explorer, Blockstream.info, and they made it way better. Uh, it's probably one of the best, exp- that and OXT.me are probably the two best explorers we have right now. Yes, especially if you have replaced by fee transactions that are in transit. Uh, blockstream.info as a block explorer is doing an incredible job of creating a, a good UX around RBF transactions in particular. I believe we talked about this a few weeks ago. Um, but, uh, yeah. Did they redesign it recently, or is it... No, it was like a couple of weeks ago, but I don't think we point. ever talked about it on RHR, and it is the... It was a big... Especially since they also have... Um, they tell you your, your fees, if you can save on fees by using uh, a SegWit address, how much you would save. And they also have privacy uh, warnings and stuff, depending on, on how you're... How you, if you're reusing addresses or certain things like that, it can detect if a Tumblr has been used. Pretty cool. And they tried like to not follow around your searches and stuff like that to help your privacy as well, correct? Well, that's a promise, you know. So you have to you're trusting them to in that respect. But they say they don't collect any information. They don't run any analytics. Uh, you can connect to it directly through Tor. Uh, so you know, but they take privacy very seriously. But to a degree, you you are still obviously trusting them. Uh, a lot of a lot. That's worthy of a mention. A lot of people. You know, they take all this care about privacy and then they look up one of their addresses in a block explorer without using a VPN or Tor. You just linked your IP to that address. You know, if, depending Guilty. if they're malicious or if they're selling data or something like that, whatever the explorer is doing, then then you've made yourself vulnerable there. It's probably a big source of privacy leaks. Yes. Uh, it's something I'm definitely guilty of myself. So don't be ashamed if you've done it yourself out there, freak. And uh, to add to this blockstream.info conversation in particular with their Block Explorer, they're so adamant about the UX and privacy and creating a good user experience for anybody using a Block Explorer. They've open sourced uh, this Block Explorer. uh, So you can search Blockstream Esplora, E-S-P-L-O-R-A, and they have uh, an open API that if you have a website, uh, I believe Bull Bitcoin, Francis Paulette, and... uh, his team are sort of implementing his Explorer into their Block Explorer, and I think it's op- it is open to anybody. So if you're thinking about adding a Block Explorer to your website, uh, definitely check out Explorer and support Bilderberg. It's very important. Um, speaking of Bilderberg, uh, the Fed Fed came out this week, said uh, they don't plan on hiking anymore this year. After uh, the last time they met, they said they would probably hike two more times. So it seems like in the traditional financial world and the traditional banking system, uh, things are not as rosy as previously thought. Uh, if the fed was willing to raise rates twice this year or thought they were going to raise rates twice this year, the last time they had met probably means they're a little bit optimistic about, uh, the growth of the economy and the pace of growth and sort of the lending markets and credit markets in particular. Uh, the fact that they balked on, uh, the notion of raising rates twice this year may signal that they are not as uh, optimistic about the future of the economy as they were the last time they met. Uh, so uh, they did not raise rates, meaning uh, credit will be cheaper, which hopefully will stoke the economy. Um, Bitcoin's over 44000 now after this announcement now. What do you think? Um, so... On a, on, a, on a simple level, lower rates right result in asset prices increasing. Uh, so we've basically seen this low rate induced asset bubble in, in mostly stocks and, and real estate. And so mm-hmm. a lot of people have theorized for a while is once you go down, it's really hard to come back up because when you come back up, you can you can pop that Things bubble. Get- yeah things get more expensive so everyone who voiced that concern was like basically called crazy and then they started raising rates and then that's what happened so now it should be interesting to see 
where we go from here because the short-term incentive is to keep rates flat or lower them because it'll, it'll make the party keep going for a little bit longer. But long-term, that you know might not be what's best. But either way, you know, owning a little Bitcoin gives you some assurances there that you can, it's almost like an insurance for, for their ineptness, right? No, I mean, that's uh, the famous quote was it? I don't know if it was Nassim Taleb that said this in particular. Was it Nassim? Insurance policy against central bank idiocy, or was it Chimat uh, Patapatia? It was one of the two. Whatever. Somebody said it. It's insurance policy against the stupidity of the Fed, which I think is pretty high right now, uh, this being the stupidity of the Fed. And I think this is a good segue into a conversation on the cancelling effect. We, or I found myself in a side conversation about the cantillon effect, uh, which basically posits that uh, those closest to the creation, uh, to, excuse me, to the spigot of money creation uh, benefit uh, asymmetrically as opposed to the people uh, in the economy at the bottom, uh, sort of uh, that totem pole of m- money creation, meaning the banks closest to the Fed window uh, are able to benefit from uh, lower prices, and by the time money gets through the economy to uh, your grocery bagger, whose uh, salary is being paid via loan, has been given out via access to the Fed window, uh, is at uh, sort of in disadvantage because by the time the money reaches him, inflation is at a point where his purchasing power is diminished. So the Cantillon effect, the thing about it is it's hard to prove with data. And I was positing maybe something to look at uh, to maybe prove that this may be right or may be a correct heuristic is to look at uh, the Fed's monetary base versus the velocity of money versus the Guinea coefficient versus stock indices versus high-end real estate since 2008 and sort of map that out to prove that uh, money is not making it through the economy. Uh, the wealth between the rich and the poor is getting uh, wider, and those closest to the creation of money are just driving asset prices higher. I don't know if you saw this conversation, Matt, but I'm interested to hear your thoughts. I, I did. I'm sorry if that was a long. I'm sorry if that was a long-winded explanation. I'm just <laughs> trying to take a bit. No, it was from a, memory. You, you did good. You did good. Uh, I, I, it's asset prices have gone up tremendously because the rates are low. And people can't own those things. Yeah, but most people right. don't own those things. Most people, the rich benefit way more when stock prices go up, real estate prices go up, than the average person who doesn't own any real estate, that owns very few stocks, if any, that's probably in debt. Uh, so there's, I, I think, yeah, as you said, it's very hard to prove with data, but it, when you look at it from like a common sense, logical point of view, it makes sense that through QE, we basically it re- we resulted in attacks from the poor to the rich, uh, from the people without access to the to the rich who have access to real assets and and and, and can take advantage of, of those increases in those prices. Uh, that's one of the nice things is uh, is about Bitcoin is that the ex- access accessibility is there. Like most people, it's more accessible than something like real estate where you know you need hundreds of thousands of dollars of upfront investment in order to participate in something like that. I think on a general basis, regardless if who ends up correct or, or right or wrong here, the fact of the matter is, is we've never been in this type of situation before where we've had rates low for such a long time. Um, basically this government fueled bubble and this policy shifting with the Fed after supposedly being super confident just goes to show that even our so-called experts and professionals have no fucking idea what to do here. They're like, you know, so I'm not, I don't think we're like arguing that we could do it better than them. The point is that they have no fucking idea. No one really has any fucking idea how to solve this in any kind of non uh, painful way. Right. And this is, Something that's interesting, too, and 
somebody I'm going to have on the podcast actually works at Unchained Capital, full disclosure, but is a Fed, men, like a mensch when it comes to Fed history, is Parker Lewis. And he wrote a paper, Ender's Game. I've, wrote, I've written a, a long Twitter thread about it last summer. Uh, but the Fed minutes are released four years after they happen uh, to the public. So he basically went back in 2016, I believe, and went back to the Fed minutes between 2005 and 2012. That's all. I mean, that's what he had access to up to that point was 2012 and was able to basically over the course of seven years dissect Fed minutes and point out glaring instances of them being completely wrong in their predictions and then backpedaling and then trying to fix it and backpedaling again and setting projections and never hitting them and it's it's just a a very uh unscientific uh s- sort of voodoo that that they're, tr- they're trying to pull off and everybody just puts up with it and then again that's why we do this show that's why we're into bitcoin it's something i'm very passionate about and it's why i left the world of finance after three years of it was my job was to know what these central banks were doing. I was like, these people have no idea what they're doing, and they run the pricing mechanism for the whole fucking economy of the world, and that's a big problem. So we're just trying to, hey, just be aware. Be aware. What do you think would be best-case scenario Fed move for Bitcoin? I mean, if they ever went NERP, it would it'd be best-case for Bitcoin. It wouldn't be best-case for the country or for the central bank but it would be best case for bitcoin like a like a couple more rounds of qe and then nerp right would be the ideal i mean that's the what you ideal look, bitcoin if you look at situation the fed, yeah but if you look at the fed funds rate it's moving lower and lower like a fractal it's like making lower and lower highs like it's hitting a ceiling and it can't go much higher and it can't go much lower either so it's are they going to break the um the x-axis that's the that's the question or is it the y-axis? I haven't looked at a chart or constructed a chart in a while. It's at the y-axis. It should be. It, it should be interesting yeah. to watch, and I'm just glad that I that I hold Bitcoin so I can opt out a bit from that. That's true. That's true. Um, speaking of opting out, it seems like uh, the U.S. is going to make it so Venezuela has no option of opting into uh, payment processor solutions like Visa and Mastercard. This is a topic you you. Uh, put up there this article is from the block i have not read it yet so i'll let you take this one away well they want to sanction they want to put sanctions on on payment processors so all the major credit card american credit card companies uh you know that obviously fucking sucks for the people of venezuela uh they they're already experiencing hyperinflation they're already being cut off from the world economy in a lot of ways uh, of their own doing and this will just further the issues that they have there uh, on a day-to-day survival basis. And it just goes to show that, you know, is, is Bitcoin a perfect solution for them now? No, of course not. But in the future, as a citizen of wherever you live, do you really want another country's government to have unilateral ability to just cut off your payments world? Right. Like you should like people say like, oh, Bitcoin, you know, why would I ever spend Bitcoin? Well, in like that situation, you know, people, tons of people would spend Bitcoin because they couldn't spend any other way. That's the only way you can. So that's when all of a sudden the fees that you have to pay to use a network like this that's censorship resistant actually become incredibly worth it because the alternative is is you just can't you can't participate in any kind of commerce. Yeah. Yeah. And do you think the payment processors have any chance of uh, standing up to the government and saying, no, this is fucked up, we don't want to do this? <laughs> no, of course not. Honestly, honestly, I'm surprised that Visa and MasterCard have been allowed to operate in there still. Like, you'd think that they wouldn't yeah. be at this point. Yeah, right? Yeah. Well, you, well, you have to imagine they, they can do uh, other... Their systems are native to other currencies, too. They're not transacting to U.S. dollars every transaction, correct? Right. It was like their local, even if they were using Bolivars, they were using it through, like, the MasterCard network, right? Yeah. 
and now that looks like that's all going to be closed down. But I, I think it's proposed, and it hasn't been made official yet. But I'd be surprised, you know, if if, if they if how it fucked up is that though? Who's that really helping? Like, is Medora really benefiting that much from these payment processors, or are you just fucking over the people who are being hurt most by this regime? Well, you know, I mean, the argument always for sanctions is that is that you know you hurt everyone, but you you destabilize the economy to the point that they get overthrown, uh, and and. I guess, in, you know, it, it does lower his tax. I mean, he probably can't effectively collect tax at this point anyway, but it lowers his tax base. It lowers, um, you know, just all types of uh, commerce. So it's it, it does, it does you, hurt the government as well, but it's going to dramatically hurt the people. And the hope is, uh, you know, just to steel man it, the hope is that, It'll push it over the the final, you know, the last couple of people that have been sticking with Maduro will hopefully switch and 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 he'll be deposed. Yeah, it's fucked. Like, aren't it? I mean, again, any of you Venezuelan freaks out there maybe listening, I, I feel I feel for you guys. I can't imagine being in the situation you are, and I just feel like. I don't know. I, I I have an uneasy feeling of the U.S. government sort of meddling in this, and I feel like this hurts more than it helps. That's all I'm gonna say. Well, the good news is is that all of this should just be irrelevant politics uh, within the next ten years as as Bitcoin adoption grows. So uh, it's it's, true. it's one of those arguments, one of those political arguments that fortunately we won't. They, we won't even have to have anymore. It'll just be irrelevant. You know, people, san- everyone's going to still try and do sanctions, and they'll be able to do softer sanctions, but they won't be able to do really hard things like this. That is true. That is true. Speaking of unnecessary politics, it seems like Ethereum is going to move forward with the changing of their POW algorithm after, uh, I believe it was 2.8% of token holders voting <laughs> uh, to reduce the the reward emissions for uh, the Ethereum blockchain from, or excuse me, not to reduce the uh, reward emissions, to change the uh, consensus, or excuse me, the uh, They want to make it ASIC algorithm. resistant. I'm using yes, my finger yes. quotes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so they're going the ASIC resistance route. We see Monero do this. Monero, I mean, they're not hard forking every six months uh, to be ASIC resistant uh, in particular. It just so happens to help. But they, uh, if you want to see a project that's trying to be a- ASIC resistant, Monero provides uh, a-, a good data set every six months because they hard fork and their hash rate drops precipitously. I believe it dropped like another 50% after the last hard fork because they basically forked out a bunch of ASICs that were created after the last fork. Um, so, yeah, it seems like Ethereum's going down this path. Brings up a bunch of questions because uh, there's some funny parallels going on between, uh, like, the SegWit2x battles and uh, the the labeling of people as maximalist and stuff like that. It seems like uh, history seems to rep- be repeating itself with Ethereum in particular. Matt, what are your thoughts? And it also obviously reminds you of the Dow fork, which was also done through carbon vote as a way to signal that there was support. But I think they had like 5% of, of stakeholders. No, I think they vote. had even less. I think it was 1.8%. Oh, so the they network. had, so voter turnout went up this time. It's at 2.8. Um, <laughs> yeah. I, I could be wrong. I could be wrong about the Dow fork, but I do believe it was lower than 2%. I disagree with Monero's uh, strategy, but. That's really the only way you can do ASIC resistance is if you, if you constantly are willing to change the POW because ultimately someone's going to make purpose-built hardware that will work better than general purpose hardware. Uh, the, and even here with this prog path, there's a lot of talk about it benefits certain GPUs over other GPUs. So like there's already an advantage baked into it. I think NVIDIA, yeah, certain are, NVIDIA GPUs yeah. are way better for it. So, like, who owns what GPU will already benefit. And then, you know, but the issue with changing the POW all the time is that then those people that are in charge of basically picking which algo you're going to switch to have an unfair advantage where they can game the system and they, they could be ready to 
to mine. So the ultimate thing is it just results in a, a way less secure. Uh, it does the opposite. It does the opposite of what the proponents claim to do, which is they say it'll distribute mining and make the network more decentralized. But really, what these networks need to do is foster as many ASICs as possible uh, from as many manufacturers as possible. So you have like the two. You have the two hurdles. You have getting through the GPU bootstrap phase where you're vulnerable from anyone who has excess GPU capacity can attack your network. Get, so you have to get through that two ASICs and then you have to get through the ASIC bootstrap phase where you only have like one or two ASIC developers, which is the issue we had with, um, with Bitmain that we finally got through that hurdle. So, so they're really going backwards. And it's, uh, so it should, it should be, I thought that was consensus opinion pretty much that ASICs are, are generally good and you want to foster ASIC uh, development and, and distribution, but uh, apparently that's not the case. So it should be interesting to see if they, if they push this through, if it becomes uh, uh, a contentious fork. I mean, like if you have ASICs right now that are going to get uh, invalidated Brit. basically because of the the fork a lot of people say like oh they'll move to etc like i don't think they're necessarily going to move to ethereum classic i think they might just continue mining the current chain that doesn't have the the forked algo in it and see where it takes them because they really don't have that much to lose they just they can they can do it for a couple of days and, and and see how the market unfolds there yeah no this is this is something I, I can't believe hasn't gotten through people's head. Like, it just makes sense. ASICs are going to be a thing. Any chain that has tried to become ASIC resistant in the past has proven uh, unsuccessful in that endeavor. Like, they're inevitable. ASICs are going to happen. Embrace them. Try to make them as efficient as possible. That's the other thing. ASICs are the most efficient way to solve these proof-of-work algorithms. Like, that's what you want is efficiency, efficiency, efficiency. We should be trying to make it as efficient as possible yeah and they um, they enhance the game theory too because your asic is 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 basically worth nothing if you if you attack the network to the point of the of the token losing value uh you freaks can't see it but i have a mic in one hand and a beer in the other and i just tried to take a sip of my mic uh it was a funny experience <laughs> by the way uh upset alert is still on vermont's up 40 to 37 uh, almost halfway through the second half uh, but another thing, saying on Ethereum, I don't want to pick on Ethereum too much, but another thing they're talking about implementing, I don't know if we touched on this with the dev incentives earlier, I think we actually skipped over it when we meant to talk about it, was their intention or possibility to add a dev reward uh, subsidy. A dev their, tax. It's called product, a dev tax. A, dev a 20% tax. dev tax. Explain it to us, Matt. I don't know. I like the terminology of tax because really at the end of the day, you know, they're trying to mimic stuff that you see in chains like Decred, uh, where where you take a portion of the block rewards and you put it towards dev funding. Uh, whether, Zcash, perfect example. Yeah, like however that gets handled. All right, but Zcash has like the 20% straight to a certain group of developers. Decred, like you, your coin holders are supposed to vote and you allocate it. I'm not sure exactly which method, you know, they'll be more similar to, but... Either way, the reason tax works well as a uh, nomenclature there is because it's involuntary. Like all holders are subsidizing that and who controls that funding is highly questionable. That, it, that can be co-opted extremely easy. While you have the, the funding mechanisms of having all these outside developer teams and also volunteer, volunteer developers from around the world doing it you that's a voluntary basis like people aren't automatically co-opted into it no i agree I, and there's this thought experiment that i always think about like think about the man who falls in a coma uh, or somebody who's like running a node or holding ether at, uh, at some point in the last two or three years falls into a coma his node's still running uh, hopefully who knows if that would be possible with ethereum but uh this man falls in a coma expecting this protocol to work a certain way and then wakes up post uh, prog POW and dev fund reward. How does that man think like this is, is this what I signed up for? And that's like the mission of Bitcoin is to think about that man who falls in a coma running an old version of a node is able to wake up and he's still in consensus. And it seems like this, this first principle mentality is completely flown over the head of a lot of projects in the space, Ethereum in particular. Exactly. Like at the end of the day, 
and like you kind of saw that with with uh, Dan Larimer of EOS, his previous project. Uh, what what was that previous one? It started with a B. Steam it. Oh, bit shares. Bit shares. He changed the code to a point where if you're if you hadn't been actively moving your keys around, you lost your keys, and like it, at the end of the day, if it's impossible to have truly cold storage on a centralized chain because you'll never know if they just change the rules behind your back. They just take your funds. You can't access your funds or they, they, they lock up your funds. They put you on a blacklist. They require KYC. All these different things can happen. So really, if your chain is centralized, cold storage is, is, is not, it's impossible. There's, there's no such thing as cold storage on a centralized chain. Exactly. And this is why we Bitcoin freaks. This is why we're so into Bitcoin in particular is they have this mindset, this think of the man in the coma mindset. And we just we're trying to tighten the rules. That's what Fidelity said. I mean, they didn't say think of the man in the coma. Right. But they said we can't do custodial Ethereum yet. And a lot of other chains because we don't really know where they're going. And we want to make sure that if we're holding billions of dollars for people that we can keep that secure. Exactly. Um, so something to keep in mind, and that's like a first principle mindset that I work from, thinking of the man of the coma. Beware of the man in the coma, freaks. It's very important. Um, what's next? Bitcoin Optech. Just wanted to touch on Bitcoin Optech this week. Uh, they are pushing for uh, exchanges, wallet providers to... Uh, support back 32 addresses in particular uh, we will link to that Bitcoin Optech in the show notes but it's something uh, back 32 helps a lot with efficiency enables uh, a lot of cool shit uh, specifically SegWit related um, but adoption of back 32 in particular uh, has, has been a bit tepid at this point uh, uh, if you have anything to say about that yeah, BEC32 is the newest address format. It's native SegWit. Uh, you'll have the lowest fees, the best privacy when you use it. Uh, a lot of new wallets are, have already supported BEC32 receives. It's the addresses that start with BC1. Uh, the big one for you freaks, of course, is Wasabi Wallet, which defaults to BEC32. So the issue is that a lot of wallets don't support sending to BEC32 yet. And... A lot mm-hmm. of services, stuff like Lolly. When we when we talk to people about using Wasabi with Lolly or Cash App, they have to. We basically have to tell them you withdraw to a Beck thirty two supporting wallet that doesn't default to Beck thirty two receiving addresses yet. So something like Electrum or Samurai, where you can send to them, and then they support sending to Beck thirty two, so then they can send out to Wasabi. So we need, yeah, we as many people using Beck thirty two as possible, and and Bitcoin Optics specifically. What they've said is. You know, if if you're hesitant to change your receive addresses to default to BEC32, that's fine. But they, it should be expected that at this point, um, this long after SegWit activation, that they should support sending all popular wallets and services to support sending to BEC32 at least. Because it's a, not only do you have these, these improvements, but it's a major UX issue. Like people are like, I put the address in, it's not valid. That's annoying. That is annoying. And ex- exactly. UX issue uh, that could get more annoying over time. And that if it's and even if it's sending only, if it's sending only, it makes 100 percent sense. Like just make it send only because this is one thing that Satoshi thought about in particular uh, was the address structure and the UX around that. He, he crafted uh, base. I always forget either 58 or 64. Uh, intentionally thinking of the UX around uh, the lowercase and uppercase I's and L's uh, and zero and uppercase O's uh, and thinking that people will get confused when they entered addresses uh, and one of the seamless UX in that regards. And it seems like if people aren't allowing people to send a Beck 32 address, that's just uh, a UX hurdle that is unnecessary and that Satoshi intentionally tried to avoid uh, with his original address structure, uh, which some people would say was not as efficient as possible, but definitely got the job done. And everyone should subscribe to uh, Bitcoin Optech newsletter. It's a weekly newsletter. Very good. And shout out to David Harding. 
dude is an incredible uh, documenter of everything that's going on and very clear and eloquent in his explanations. Last topic. Uh, this is, yeah, this is, uh, I think I offhandedly talked about this in the bank yesterday, but it's an interesting uh, stat to note. Hash rate is 4x where it was when we hit 20k in December 2017. Um, so despite the over 80% fall in price over the last two years, um, excuse me, year, year and a half, uh, hash rate has 4x. So the amount of people expending, uh, or excuse, not the amount of people, but uh, the amount of energy expended to secure and mine the Bitcoin blockchain has 4x since December 2017. And more recently, we've had a... Uh, a very tight range of stabilization with the difficulty adjustments. The last one was on March 10th, and we had a slight downward difficulty adjustment, but it was only zero, or yeah, 0.05%. And then before that, we had a slight difficulty adjustment up, which was 0.17%, and that was following another difficulty adjustment uh, upwards on February 10th of 4.25. So we're in this weird, tight range of hash rate, which I don't think we've ever seen this this type of a range uh, in Bitcoin's history. So um, whether that's optimistic or pessimistic, I don't know. I think I think I would trend towards optimistic uh, because despite the price fall, people are still <laughs> dumping capital into mining in particular. Yeah, I mean, so much for that, all that mining, death spiral, uh, fear mongering, bullshit. complete bullshit. Right. We called that one out when it happened, so... You just called that out in 2014, 2015, so. <laughs> just wanted to toot our own horn on that one. Yeah. Um, recurring FUD. I guess maybe we'll end it. We'll end it. We're, we got 10 minutes left. We'll end it with a segment on recurring FUD. Uh, so the, the Bitcoin mining death spiral, will it ever go away or will it be perpetual recurring FUD? Matt O'Dell, what are your thoughts? I, I, I think it will always be recurring. Because I think, you know, I, look, it was all newer people that were really scared about it this time around, right? And I think, it'll, I think that'll be the same thing next time. And you, you know, when Ari the, Paul was worried about it, bro. Yeah, exactly. And dude runs a huge-ass fund uh, and was, like, going at me about it. He also, by the way, believes that the having uh, doesn't is, – is already priced in, which is complete bullshit. So we'll – prove him wrong on that one uh when when we see that unfold but uh the mining death spiral sh is you know it'll never go away when when the price is falling dramatically like people are also you know everyone's on edge everyone's freaking out all of a sudden people that were never concerned about like worst case scenarios are like going through these ridiculous mind experiments uh which i by the way love to do but uh you got to put your realism shoes on a lot of times Right. Um, yeah, so the mining death spiral, it'll be around. It's nothing that I'm afraid of. I just, again, uh, people are still mining Bitcoin in China for a certain particular reason. I don't think they're worried about uh, worried about the price. There's people out there with, with other needs and other, other reasons for their mining. Yeah, I'm sure, we'll, I'm sure we'll be talking about this for years to come. I also what what other what other kind of reoccurring fud will we always get? We just got the other thing is all this fud like it it gets clicks because it's fear mongery and the people there's like there's authors that are literally been calling for oh, Bitcoin to fail for such a long time that they just keep Let's call him out by name. Let's call him out by name. David Gerard. Fuck <laughs> David Gerard. Well, I was about to. I was uh, I was uh, I was doing a transition, Marty. But yeah, that's a fud line. He just published in Foreign Policy that um, you know the 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 asshole fucking shot up everyone in in New Zealand uh, at at the mosques. He in his manifesto mentioned BitConnect. He was a BitConnect investor, which is the the famous Ponzi scheme that a lot of us called out before it blew up. Uh, couple years ago a year and a half ago and he like connected that to bitcoin and then was like nazis use bitcoin and i think that's a reoccurring fud line that we'll see a lot yeah false equivalencies that's and, and that goes 
I think that type of FUD goes hand in hand with the energy FUD. The Bitcoin is boiling the oceans oh. FUD. It's it's false equivalencies. Uh, if people are allowed to, with the energy FUD in particular, if cruise ships, one cruise ship which expands or ex- excuse me uh, expends more energy into the atmosphere than a million cars in one day um is is not causing an uproar like bitcoin mining which uh is magnitudes of order cleaner as an indi- industry overall than any other industry on average it's a complete false equivalency to sort of uh call out bitcoin for using a certain amount of energy, most of which is que- clean, by the way, and not call out, say, something like a cruise ship. This can be applied to, uh, again, what that asshole did in New Zealand, whether or not he used Bitcoin or BitConnect, whatever it is, he could have used U.S. dollars or another form. It's it's a false equivalency. It's fucking bullshit. Yeah, I mean, he used, he used New Zealand dollars every day, right? So it's fucking ridiculous. No one can. No exactly. one's like, oh, the. New, I don't even know what they call their dollars over there. But like, no one's like, oh, the New New Zealand fi- the Kiwi. fiat did it. The Kiwi fiat did the ki- it. <laughs> Kiwi. Um, that's a cute. That's a cute currency name. The Kiwi. I always like the Kiwi. Ener- energy uh, efficiency fund is gonna be a big one for a while. When that one's not yeah. gonna. Whatever. But it's all bullshit. Let's. If anybody comes to you with the energy fund, spins on them so hard that their mind. That's actually been. One of my best, uh, one of my best arguments for not arguments, one of my best ways at having people I'm trying to explain Bitcoin to in person recently, uh, sort of have an aha moment via the energy. It's like, yo, there's a bunch of untapped clean energy in the world that nobody ever uses because you can't transport it, and now we have incentive to go to that clean energy and actually use it, tap into it via Bitcoin mining. Uh, that may drive. That obviously drives production of, but may drive innovation of clean energy sources. Maybe we'll figure out how to transport it, but just the fact that we're testing around with that in particular uh, will hopefully lead to some positive externalities. Then on top of that, you want to get into dirty energy. Let's talk about fracking. Let's talk about flaring and releasing methane into the atmosphere on site at these fracking uh, sites. It's 30 times worse for the atmosphere to just release that ap- that methane into the air without expanding it. Guess what? Now we have incentive to be as efficient as possible on site in these fracking sites. Bitcoin miners show up, cap that methane, which otherwise would have been sent into the atmosphere to pollute our atmosphere and expedite this global warming crisis, whatever people think is happening right now. Like it takes that energy and uses it and turns it into digital gold, a sovereign currency that gives you security and it allows you to become a sovereign individual. Like it will make the shit more efficient. Freaks spin zone the energy fud. It's so easy to do. And it's actually helped me. That was a fantastic rant. I, I loved it. I was very happy with it. Thank you. I'm I'm currently sitting in paradise, so talking about FUD is I'm not so enthusiastic about it right now. The other line is, uh, but I appreciate your enthusiasm around it because that was a very good rant. Uh, the other line of FUD I would say would be a big line of FUD would be uh, the money laundering FUD. Uh, I think it just came out that the Wall Street Journal uh, report about shape shifts uh, helping yeah, money launders was grossly misrepresented paul vigna eat it bro what are you doing you know money laundering is an easy target because as far as status are concerned like if you have any money outside you know money laundering can be whatever they they want it to be so if you have any money that is that is actually under your control then that you can you can create that false equivalency there and try and basically like criminalize ownership and usage. Yes. So again, uh, be aware of that FUD in particular as well. And that was a great 10 minute segment we did there. I had a lot of fun. Yeah, that was a nice little ad hoc uh, FUD uh, preemption. And get, exactly. The FUD preemption is important. Get out in front of it, freaks. I think the energy one's an easy spin zone one. Uh, you know, you can riff off my explanation if you want to. It's obviously it can obviously improve. I'm not the most eloquent well-spoken freak out there um matt that's all the topics we have for today you have any final thoughts final musings um 
I always hate these remote sessions, so I'm looking forward to being back in the studio with you next week. And uh, feels I good. I thought to... this was a good one, though. Yeah, this is good. I feel like, uh, yeah, I thought this was a good one. We're getting, yeah, we just cut each other off for one of the first times the whole pod, but uh, we're getting better at the remote recording, which is good. It, it keeps us flexible, especially, you know, at any time. I don't want to get too comfortable with it, though. <laughs> there we go. Exactly. Don't get too comfortable. But I'm looking forward to seeing yeah. you again. And, uh, you know, we just passed 4,000. I know it feels good, but you got to stay humble, guys. Uh, you know, we might have one more bad downturn here before, you know, this might be the last head fake. It might not. We might we might have bottomed. But either way, just stay humble and, and don't get too far ahead of yourselves. Yeah, not going to lie. I'm trending towards bull trap right now, but I'll take, uh, I'll take uh, above 4K Bitcoin any day of the week. <laughs> um, feels good. Feels good. Have, it always feels good. Always feels good. Feels good at sitting down with Matt. Even though it's remotely, I hope you feel good where you are. I feel good looking at where you are because it's uh, much better than than Brooklyn right now. Uh, upset alert: Florida State's up by two with eight to go. So Vermont, oh, nope. Vermont tried to tie it up, but they got eight minutes left. We're gonna keep watching this game. Matt, enjoy the rest of your vacation, freaks. Thank you for joining us. Peace and love. Cheers. <laughs>